Can I be heard? Hopefully you can hear. Yes. Me. Yes. 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 Um, okay. So I don't want to uh, spend a long time talking about ramp as such. For those of you who don't know, actually, it's, it's our second anniversary, basically. Uh, so um, obviously, the pandemic was unprecedented for everyone, and um, one of the things we did early on was to try to mobilize uh, quite a large number of willing people, uh, mostly with experience in modeling and the physical sciences to help out with the modeling efforts at then that time, which were, um, of course, being led by SPIM and feeding into SAGE. So the first uh, few months of RAMP uh, involved a lot of people, some with previous uh, epidemic modeling experience, but not on people, some with no such experience directly, uh, uh, helping in all kinds of ways. And uh, as Graham will say a bit more about later, um, one of the things we set up was a, 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 an activity for uh, people to start making models and coordinate that even among people who were not you know uh, seasoned card carrying modelers but one of the things which has been quite interesting about ramp in the uh, year and a half since that kind of intense phase um so ramp was continued through a ukri grant called the continuity network which claire already mentioned and has now morphed into this structure which is mostly uh, uh, organizing meetings like this one mostly at the newton institute um, what's interesting is, though, that since those early days of RAMP, I mean, a lot, quite a number of people who started modeling then, uh, human epidemic modeling at that time, whether they were doing so specifically under RAMP auspices or uh, under their own steam, have uh, basically em emerged into and joined the pre existing modeling community. Um, so I think uh, hopefully they're. Uh, Ramp has brought some new insights and perspectives into the epidemic modeling field, and uh, I think that will be one of the things that uh, this meeting will hopefully demonstrate. And uh, as well as that, I think it's good at this uh, stage to take stock of what was done in some cases quite early in the process, some of which has continued, some of which uh, as just the baton has been passed and celebrate to, to that extent um, the contribution of this wider community of people who were engaged rather against their expectations and suddenly in the modeling of human epidemic diseases uh, with or without much prior exposure to the subject. So thank you for coming everybody uh, and it's ex I'm very pleased to, to just look at the list of people who are here, uh, many of whom are you know firmly in the uh, continuing epidemic modeling efforts uh, some of whom have kind of dropped in and maybe no longer doing this. Um, and it's great to, to reassemble uh, parts of this effort uh, for today. So thank you very much. And over to Graham. Thank, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm not sure I have very much to, to add to that, really. Um, I was uh, invited by Mike to uh, try to coordinate the uh, diverse group of people who were going to write their own models rather than um, uh, contribute directly to the existing spy -in models. I think that's introduced quite a lot of, um, of really beneficial stuff. There's been some very good stuff done, I think, around um, driving up the standard of coding. Um, and some novel ways of approaching problems, which uh, spy and to their credit were very keen that, that uh, they could have something to look across and we might avoid any danger of, of groupthink that they might have working with the same data with the same people all the time so i think some of the the more uh, eccentric ways that we've we've done things have been beneficial particularly when ultimately they they come to the same sorts of um, big picture conclusions as the, the existing models um <clears throat> of course uh, coordinating a bunch of academics to to write a bunch of codes is is really a, a cat herding problem, and so I was mainly uh, involved in just trying to facilitate getting people uh, access to data, which was a problem early on, but but got resolved later. And I think the UK has done extremely well on uh, uh, eventually on on data access and uh, and availability. Um, I think that's, that's really all I'd like to say at the moment, rather than generalising, and I, I'm not going to try to list all of the people who uh, who contributed. 
Uh, but I will say that there were many more than are going to be presented today. Um, uh, but I think we should just press on and uh, hear, hear from them about the real science. So I'll, I'll pass over to um, uh, uh, Jean Paolo to uh, uh, host the actual session with the real science. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you can hear me less importantly see me, but at least hear me. Just two personal comments before I begin. The first one, thank you for having me as chairman. The second one, since I mainly work abroad with reference to Great Britain, is I would like to express my admiration for how, for the shared effort of the British academia confronting the COVID epidemic, because this has not been as concerted and united in many other countries. And RAMP, I guess, is one of the examples of this common effort to do something about the COVID pandemic. So that was the personal part. So let's come go to the presentations in this first session. Once again, two comments. One is to the audience. As has been said before, if you have questions, please write them in the chat and then we'll try to make space for them in the last minutes of each talk. And for the speakers, of course, to leave a couple of minutes at the end of each talk for the questions that will be in the chat. So having said these things, I think we can move on with this first session. And do we have the first speaker somewhere? Jasmina, is Jasmina around? And we, it doesn't look like she's joined us just yet. Claire has chased her up, but um, she doesn't actually appear to be with us um, just no, at the moment. She doesn't from the list, at least I thought she had some other identity in the list, <laughs> but no. Uh, do you prefer us to go to the second speech first to invert, or shall we wait a minute? Um, I think maybe if we just make, wait um, maybe 30 Couple seconds or so just okay. to see if she comes back to Claire. Um, yes. Otherwise, um, if not, Ian, would you be happy to uh, <clears throat> deliver your talk? Anticipate yours. No problem. I just okay. finished my talk a minute ago, so I'm good <laughs> to go. Okay, well, we're safe. So let's wait a couple of minutes and see if Jasmina turns up, because uh, it's a very interesting title that I would very much like to hear the well, we are we are expecting her because she was in email contact with yes. Claire and myself earlier today. So possibly she's just um, delayed in joining for some reason. Technically, she's not late yet. No, one minute. <laughs> so, so we should at least wait until the, the minute when she's due to start before moving on yes, to the next speaker. Perfectly good, right. Good point. Yes, to allow myself a little pun. I mean, if Jasmine is slightly late for her talk, then Ian will be quite early for his talk because if the title hasn't changed, it's about June, which is still a couple of months away. But I don't know, Ian, are you talking about the same title? This individual-based yes, right. model, June? Yes. Yes, that's right. I'm, I'm basically giving Frank's talk because Frank is sadly has COVID right now, so it's a bit unwell, so um <clears throat> Okay. It's very confusing working on June during the month of June. So uh, uh, on here. the call now is Jasmina P. Yes, here she is. Okay, do we have Jasmina? Does she hear she's, us? She's, she's just uh, needs to unmute. She looks like she's just sitting down. Yes. I am sorry. I'm. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm late. I'm okay. just going to work through the um, through uh, maybe changing the camera actually. 
Well, the fact is that my computer... If, if I do the just, camera this way, that's better, isn't yes, it? My computer clock just changed to 46, so you arrived during 13.45, so it's not that bad. So may I introduce Jasmina Panovska-Griffiths, and she will talk about something that at least has left me wondering, why does a variant die out when a better one arrives, and where, why does it happen so quickly in a way which has amazed me now and then because it has already happened a couple of times during this pandemic so please jasmina tell us why okay i will first of all try to share my screen i think my video automatically switches off when i do that can i just check that you can see that screen Yes, we now see a screen. It's a little bit small and square, but we see it quite well. Okay, now it's full screen. Now it's, now it's full screen? Okay. Yes, full screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I will talk today is I'll give you a brief introduction to what my approach to modeling is and give you a brief introduction to a model that I have, co I have helped co-develop and actively have used over the last two years. And then I'll give you two examples of recent studies, one that looked at um, one of the reasons I believe to answer that uh, title question is the progressive transmissibility and we've, we have been able to quantify that. And then the second one, we will explore the impact of um, how that transmissibility couples with immune evasiveness by studying the doubling rate of Omicron over um, from November, so generally over December and January 2020, uh, January, January 2022. First of all, I, I really want to make a, a point that I think modeling is art, and therefore I think of us modelers as a type of artist, and everyone has their own signature in the way they do modeling. I visualize and I use modeling as a tool for answering, answering complex questions because I believe it gives a really good technical framework in which we can simulate different futures, which we call scenarios, but they are obviously subjected to different assumptions and caveats we make uh, in, in terms of the parameters. Um, I think modeling has been useful and will remain useful in informing science and therefore offering a scientific advice to policy decision makers. I'm briefly going to tell you that this is not something I've just started doing, but I have been answering different modeling questions all the way through 2020, and they were varying from very early on, why is this new virus spreading exponentially, to what are the characteristics of the new variant in November 2020, and what how should we be uh, vaccinating uh, when we started in december 2020 um, this continued in 2021 with questions around the impact of possible st vaccination strategies the the impact of reopening at different stages and specifically the delay at step four which i will mention briefly in my talk and then uh, studies around uh, vaccinations and whether we should be vaccinating specific cohorts and added vaccinations as well as booster vaccinations using of npis non-pharmaceutical interventions such as masks um, at schools and then um, in October, November 2021, when we realize there is Omicron spreading, what is the transmissibility, which is what I will talk about later in the talk. And um, then more recently, what was or more recently work around sort of um, modeling around Christmas 2021 and the impact of the booster vaccination on Omicron growth. The uh, work that I will talk um, today falls in questions three and four, but really question three um, and question, and this is all about the impact of uh, what should we do with emerging variants? So in order to do something, we need to understand them better. And that, that's why the, the title question, how do we know what is driving one variant to die when a new one emerges? So I will do this via two case studies. Um, there are two parts of the first case study, one that looks at progressive transmissibility of B1.177 versus alpha and versus delta. 
in the period between September 2020 and July 2021. And this work is available as a preprint and has been accepted for publications. I'm just going through the revisions, where the second one is looking uh, more recently um, at Omicron versus Delta and specifically the children variants of Omicron versus the Delta. And then the second one I will talk later on in the talk is about how do we, uh, if we if we look at the doubling rate of Omicron, could we have got that um, that doubling rate with different combinations of transmissibility and immune escape characteristics? And what does that tell us about potential new emerging variants? Um, a paper is very soon to be submitted that looks at contrasting the England and the South African setting on this. So just a really brief introduction for, for those that are not familiar with. So Covasim is an agent-based model that was initially developed developed with by the Institute for Disease Modeling, with whom I have a long-standing collaboration going back to modeling HIV, measles, and other infectious diseases. Um, it, was, it was the UK model initially, and now England model has specifically been developed by me. And it is one of the models that has been used for now casting and, and will be used for producing medium-term projections. COVASIM stands for COVID-19 agent-based simulator, so therefore this is a stochastic agent-based model. We think it's very simple to use and install. It's, it's written fully in Python and it's fully co compatible, can be run very quickly with a small number of simulations up to 100 within, uh, within 40 minutes on a standard laptop. Um, it has been tested by a number of collaborators worldwide and it's fully documented. The important thing is that it's not something that we've wrote on the back of an envelope as a set of equation and decided to simulate, uh, but this has been designed in partnership with public health officials, epidemiologists and software developers. Just very briefly, because it's an agent-based model, it incorporates disease progression of individuals through different stages and dependent on age and comorbidities and at the same time accounts for disease transmission via the viral load to change across these characteristics. This is the main thing that affects transmissibility, which is what I will talk for the rest of the talk. Um, uh, you can just uh, read this slide, which basically says how it has been used in the UK, um, and it's calibrated to publicly available data, uh, models vaccine, vaccine efficacy as per the other SPIRE models. We inc include waning of immunity, both uh, due to infection, prior infection, and due to uh, vaccination with different doses. And it has been used to answer a number of policy relevant questions through to, uh, as I said, from 2020 all the way to now. The model for Scotland has recently been developed and is now in use for now cast in medium term projections, uh, whereas the models for Wales and Northern Ireland are is still in development. Okay, just briefly, we are quite um, clear as, as I'm a mathematician and so I am very clear that the modeling that we do has to be robust and technically correct. The, the, the term for that in modeling is calibration. So we calibrate the model at the moment by sweeping through a hyperparameter space by looking at the parameters that make sense to change across different stages of the epidemic and then we match them. These are just an illustration of a match over a certain period where the sort of solid lines uh, are the, the, the model and then the sort of squares that are very kind of close, so they look like a thick line on these plots, are the data. Okay, so let's now kick off and give a little uh, sort of flavor of the work that we've been doing. The first example is going to talk about using the publicly available um, um, genomic data in the UK, which are coming from the uh, Koch UK consortium in the period between September 2020 and, and middle of July 2021. Um, the, the process is statistical analysis, specifically multivariate regression analysis, where we take the counts of different variants in each of the LTLAs across England, and we use um, we used actually a number of different statistical models, but the one that we settled on at the end as the best fit model uh, was a hierarchical generalized additive model or HGAM. Um, and we use that model to allow us to quantify the differential in transmissibility between different variants by looking at the growth rate over the periods that are the same at the onset of the variant. So that was one part of the analysis and it gave results of how much more or less transmissible 
each new variant is. And parallel to that, we did a calibration of Covacin by seeding a new variant at the point when it emerged in England nationally. And we then compared the growth rate uh, over the periods. And we did this progressively. We calculated the growth rate within the first two weeks of occurrence, within the next uh, month of occurrence, and the, within the next two months, etc., as the data became more available. Um, as this was the case, uh, we, we were able to simulate basically the epidemic and by doing so, in order to match the epidemic and the model projected ones, we, were, we, we could only do that for certain transmissibility of the new variant with respect to the old one. So this is some of the results which um, you can read more about on that preprint. So um, if we compare a variant B.1177 versus alpha and versus delta, so this is over the period September 2020 to July the 12th, 2021, we found out that um, B.1177 was about 20% more transmissible than the wild type. And then alpha was even more transmissible than B.1.177, whereas delta was 65 to 90% more transmissible than alpha. So if we look at these maps, these maps are basically the results that tell us, we call it the multiplicative RT, so that we, we, we can either measure this via the reproduction number quantifiable in, in terms of transmissibility or by growth rate, but these are, they, are closely, they are closely related. So the trends in reproduction number will follow the trend in the growth rate. And um, what we see from the graphs on the left is that we have um, a variation of dots between yellow and red. And the, uh, in yellow, we have a low advantage of the new variant, whereas in red, we have a high transmissibility advantage of the new variant. So you'll agree that on the maps that we see, for each new variant, so alpha followed B.177 and delta followed alpha, there is a heterogeneity in terms of uh, the new variant being more transmissible than the old one. On average, across all the LTLAs, we have a highly more transmissible and delta being notably more transmissible than alpha and alpha being notably more transmissible than the prior one. However, heterogeneity is present. More recently, we did the same analysis where we look at the delta versus Omicron because our hypothesis is that the new emerging variant is going to be more transmissible. Now, the, the difference with Omicron is that Omicron kind of has split into three sub-variants, which are B.1, B.1.1, and B.2. So actually the analysis which we are just preparing to submit, and this is work together with Ben Swallow at University of Glasgow, actually compared uh, B.1 with B.1.1 and them two with B.2, and all of those three with the delta. But what I'm showing here as results is if we just compare B.1 with delta, then it's approximately 22% more transmissible than delta. However, in some places it's less. So um, the confidence intervals, uh, the 95% conf confidence intervals vary between minus 15 and 99%. And that heterogeneity we can see on the first map on the right, because we see pockets uh, within the LTLAs where it's more yellow, and but the majority is red. Then on the other side, we have a B.2, B which um, actually across all the LTLAs seems to be more transmissible than Delta. Now, as I said, we can compare B.2 with B.1.1 and with B.1, but we, at the moment we are generally comparing this one with Delta in these results. And again, there is a special, there is a spatial heterogeneity, but overall 53% more transmissible with a 20 to 100%, 95% a confidence interval. So this suggests that each progressive variant, each new variant is progressively more transmissible. Now, using this um, result, we then apply it, applied it in order to look at the reopening at step four in July 2021, and, our, and also the impact of vaccination, because once we can 
fit the model and we know how much more transmissible safe in this case delta was compared to alpha we can then explore what would happen if delta hadn't come or what would happen if delta had come and we opened in june 20 um 2021 rather than in july 2021 so there wasn't that delay at step four and then similarly what would have been the case if there was no other uh, rollout of vaccination in december 2020 i think these figures are quite self-explanatory um, and if we just look at the um, sort of right hand side of each of the right right corners of each of these plots uh, you will see for example if we look at the plot plot a on the left then the large pink wave that we see there is in absence of vaccination with opening in june whereas uh, the light pink is a second a wave of the delta wave that is simulated uh, in presence of vaccination. That is, so on the top is uh, the, the, the pinkish colors on the left graph represent the daily new infections, whereas the more orangey brown colors represent daily hospitalizations. On the graph on the right, we did a, a, a sort of different analysis where we compared the impact of reopening um, in June or delaying the step four reopening to July. And uh, the difference again between the sort of uh, fuchsia color and the purple color uh, on the right hand side top graph is the difference if we reopened in June being the fuchsia color and if we reopened in July being the purple color. And then similarly that is translated, but it's, it's less visible in the severe cases which are a proxy for hospitalization. So, the usage of the sort of uh, knowing that the emerging variant, which in this case was Delta, was more transmissible than the previous ones, allowed us to simulate projections and different scenarios going forward. Okay, so that was the first study that I talked about. And as I said, the paper is available for half of it, and the other one we are hoping to be soon available on Matter Half. The second study. Uh, we'll talk about some more recent work which we're just preparing to submit and this looks at um, quantifying the effect from transmissibility and immune escape characteristics on omicron's doubling rate so the method here is just the cover sim simulation model we seated about thousand and we varied this number to explore whether the results were sensitive and they, they, they were not we seeded around 1,000 Omicron infections into the population around 15th of November, and we, this was a distribution. This was the average of the distribution. And we modeled Omicron to have a shorter latent period uh, based on the generation time being shorter than previous variants. And we also assumed it to be 20% less likely to, be, um, to, to end up in hospital with Omicron. We varied the transmissibility and the degree of immune evasion in order to explore how these two dimensions affect Omicron's doubling rate. And the variations were, as the last paragraph says there, two to six times of the level of the wild type of transmissibility, and then two to 100 fold reduction in the level of NAPs. I'm just noting that we modeled differently if people were vaccinated and if people had a prior infection. So this is the results. Um, so looking across December 2021, um, this was um, sort of frozen at time when we considered the doubling rate to be 2.8, but we can repeat it easily if we look at a longer time and if we look at, for example, B.1 versus B.11 or B.12, B.21. But assuming the doubling rate of 2.8 doubles per week for Omicron in England over December 2021, um, different combinations of transmissibility relative to wild and cross immunity against previous variant uh, is going to give us that doubling rate. So, for example, zooming here, uh, if we look at 2.8, this can be attained with a transmissibility of 4 on the x axis and a 4% immunity on the y axis. But 2.84, which is very similar, can also be attained with a transmissibility of six on the x-axis and a higher, very much higher cross immunity of 64% on the y-axis. So what we are actually suggesting 
is that really is a combination not only of the transmissibility, even though we have the statistical analysis is suggesting that is a, a key parameter, um, but it's the immune evasion and uh, it, it is also is also important. And overall, there is a, a non-linear function. Doubling rate is a non-linear function of the transmissibility relative to the to, to wild and the cross immunity uh, versus uh, previous infections uh, uh, versus previous variants. Again, I'm noting that there are a number of sensitivities analysis that can be done here, where we consider cross immunity to be cross immunity to um, to alpha to Delta, uh, et cetera. i just show you um, a small other result, which is um, if we, for example, pick up from that um, heat map some values where we are still getting two point, roughly 2.8 doubling rate for Omicron weekly, this can happen across each of those curves. So the black one is when we have a Omicron-like variant that is, has a higher transmissibility but, and higher cross immunity. Then it's a combination of both or uh, the, immune the immune evading variant is in red. So one obvious result this is when we compare, for example, the black and the red curves. And then we see that we can have, uh, if we have a uh, follow an Omicron wave driven by a highly transmissible but less immune evasive variant, get, that can happen two months earlier and much and, and larger than, for example, if we had an immune evasive variant that was less transmissible. So this is again, this is a snapshot of a combination of numbers that work for that heat map, and we can look at different ones. And again, if we furnish the model with more data, and if we stratify it for B.1 or B.1.1 or B.2.2, B then the, these curves might look slightly different. But that's the beauty of modeling, because we can just tweak those parameters and do that. So in summary, our statistical analysis and agent-based modeling with COVID-SIM suggests that there's been a progressive, progressively increasing transmissibility may be responsible for the emerging SARS-CoV-2 variants in England. And I'm putting maybe here because the following the follow analysis uh, that looked at matching the doubling time for Omicron and then exploring whether one level of transmissibility only works, suggests that this is a nonlinear function of transmissibility of the variant and the immune escape properties. So I think we need to keep an open mind about what is making one variant die out when a new one emerges, when a new one emerges. And I think it's really important to note, so we have assumed some certain horizon of imprinted prior immunity. If we assume a different imprinted uh, horizon of prior immunity, then these results can be analogously done, but they might look different. So therefore, the paper we're looking now is contrasting these equivalent results for England and South Africa. And I hope that I'll be able to share with you soon on, uh, on matter and then uh, published. Um, Obviously, this is uh, a teamwork, and the team that I'm working with is uh, within the, as I said, the Institute for Disease Modeling um, in the States, as well as Robin at, at Denmark, Ben Swallow um, at um, University of Glasgow, and then uh, a team in my uh, Oxford group, uh, in Christoph Fraser's group in Oxford. And then I have been working closely with Russell Weiner at UCL and Chris Bonnell in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine since the onset. So I will stop there and then take questions. Thank you very much, Jasmine. A very interesting talk. Let me see. Yes, an applause. There are applauses of various kinds in the participant list. Um, let me see if there are any questions now in the chat. Not yet. And among raised hands. Well, meanwhile, may I ask you something? You have motivated quite well why new variants will grow quicker than previous things and faster and whatever. But why do they have to win over the older ones? Why can they not coexist in a way? Because they seem to have replaced each other one after the other. So 
we, I think we all know the lotka volterra modeling, right? Where you have a coexistence for a certain bifurcation of different parameters in a simple model like that. And the reality is that when we explored um, what very early on, will Omicron take over Delta or will it coexist with it? Actually, the first few weeks when I was modeling Omicron, I was getting kind of parallel trajectories for both, so growth rates that were happening for, for both Delta and for Omicron. And then as more data came two weeks later, Omicron, when I calculated the, the same analysis and the transmissibility, uh, it was higher. Then three weeks later, it was higher and so on. So it overtook it when, uh, when actually the transmissibility reached a certain threshold where the, the trajectory that was uh, Delta and that was Omicron, sort of the Omicron's basically slope increased more rapidly. So the exponential growth of Omicron at that stage was overtaking the exponential growth of, um, of Delta. And I think that is the main thing. And why I'm mentioning um, the sort of Lotka Volterra is because in a certain parameter regime, if you do the bifurcation analysis, the sensitivity analysis and the parameters, you can get oscillatory behavior there, which here would translate to the co coexistence of the two variants. So I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not possible. It wasn't possible for the analysis that we did because as the data was were coming in, it was clear that the, the exponential growth rate was steeper for every new emerging variant. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Meanwhile, some questions have come in. We have a couple of minutes from Rondra Adikari. We have how many parameters does the model have? A huge number. I've counted up to 50, but we change, we keep changing the model and we, we keep adding them. So, for example, if we look at cross immunity of people who have been vaccinated with one, two and three doses versus those that had a prior infections with alpha or delta, we've already increased that number of parameter space. So large. But I think we are these complex models are well catered to simulate large number of parameters. So there's no worry that if the number of parameters increases, we are losing on accuracy, if that's where the question was going. And uh, are these things detailed in some kind of preprint of your work? Is it already out? Yeah, so we have a paper, Kovacim's work is published in PLOS Computational Biology last year, um, and the methodology for calibrating as well as a sort of exemplar analysis is in that paper. And then my work specifically uh, for, for the early, so 2020, 2021 work focusing on opening schools, focus on use of masks and, um, and uh, the reopening um, have been published, well, have been published 2020, 2021, and more recently um, in January. Okay, a quick one from Graham. Does Covacim have both Omicron and Delta at the same time? In the simulation has omicron and delta, delta at the same time it does have them so we we have within the model different variants competing with each other and that's why we were able to look at a when one win, a win will over compete the other okay. there was another question but i can answer that in the yeah. chat okay yes there are some uh... Well, yes, we are approaching 15, uh, 14, 15 British time. Um, Mike so, has his hand up. I don't know. Yes, maybe there are two questions left, one from Carl Whitfield and one from Kirsty Bolton. If you answer them in the chat, I think uh, they will both be happy. Thank I you very much, Jasmina. Thank you for having me. And now so, um, something completely different. Uh, no, maybe not. But anyway, Ian Vernon will present.